Welcome to an introduction to synthetic data for trusted research environments data experts. I'm Christina Magda, I'm the Data Collections Development Manager at UK Data Service, and I wear a little bit of two hats. So I focus on negotiating and acquiring data for the service, but I also focus on the research data management training portfolio, so trying to encourage the adoption of best practices. Now, why we're organizing these events? Well, firstly, thank you to, to, to our fantac fantastic synthetic data expert, Jules, um, and she's, she'll give you a brief introduction and also a code demo so you can see how, how straightforward it can be. It's nothing scary. Um, but we also want to understand more from those working in trusted research environments what would be the benefits, what would be the challenges of actually deploying synthetic data? And we do appreciate there is a lot of enthusiasm in the area. So we do have some people that might not work in trusted research environments. You might be data users, you might even be data owners as well. And we do encourage you to engage with us. And I'm going to be talking about our project a little bit. Um, so, so I'm not taking from Jewel this time. So today's program, initially we're doing this introduction to our project balancing the data skills. So all talking about synthetic data from a data owner and trusted research environment perspective. And then I'm passing the mic to Jules to talk to you about synthetic data. What is synthetic data? What types of synthetic data there are? What purposes can synthetic data be used for in the big infrastructure in the big environment. So there might be some things that you've never considered. I certainly know I haven't considered before seeing Jules's presentation. Uh, then we're going to have a Q&A and we encourage everyone to, to, to be open, ask all the questions that you need. But we do appreciate sometimes questions might come later on. So please, please do get in touch. Um, we're going to have a break. Um, we can get another coffee. It is Monday morning at the end of the day. Uh, and then Jules will do a live coding demonstration. Everything is open access, so you can use it at your own leisure as well. And then we're we are finalizing with another Q&A. So for those that are unaware about UK Data Service, a very, very brief introduction. We do host the largest collection of social, economic and population research data in the UK. But we're not only about providing access to the data, it's providing support and guidance to everyone in the data ecosystem. So from data owners and data producers to data users as well. How do I use the data? How do I make most of this? We are a partnership between different organizations. So myself, I'm based at UK Data Archive at University of Essex, but Jules is based at KT Marsh Institute, which is at University of Manchester. And we do have colleagues at Edina as well, and also UCL. We are here to support the development of best practices for data preservation and sharing standards. We make everything available as open access, with the exception of data, because of course that needs to be protected. So we have a three-tier license and access framework in place. Now, currently we have over 9,700 data collections, um, and we usually get around 250 new data collections and new editions added each year to our catalog. So some of the collections that we make available, they do get um, enhancements throughout time, or if we're talking, for example, longitudinal data, new waves, new sweeps are being added, so that would be a new um, edition. We have roughly 48,000 registered users. A lot of people are using data from UK Data Service, and they account for 130,000 data accesses worldwide. And we say data accesses because some data can be downloaded, some data needs to be accessed remotely. Now, to put this in practice, um, we look at the numbers and it's like, oh, that, that looks okay. But in practice, a UK data collection is accessed every six minutes. Every six minutes, someone makes use of, of data. So this is the power of secondary data research. Now, when it comes to synthetic data, it's not necessarily a, a very new subject, but it is gaining a lot more traction. And we can see even in terms of definitions, synthetic data can be defined quite differently. And within our project, we're going to actually make a difference between synthetic data created from real data and what Jules coined as data-free synthetic data. Data that is not created from real data, but from documentation, from metadata, and so on. Now, why synthetic data? Why is it getting all of this traction? Uh, and Jules is going to be talking in terms of practical um, uses for synthetic data, 
but we also hear reduced risk, collaboration, further data sharing, privacy protection, confidentiality, innovation, scalability. So everyone's really keen on making use of synthetic data, especially as more and more data are being made available. In case you're interested to see how synthetic data can be of use, um, Cypher has done a fantastic job in creating a synthetic population. Um, uh, we have the case study on our web pages and you can read all, all about it. They have used Understanding Society and a huge thank you goes to the ICER team here at the University of Essex as well. Because they were very keen um, to support the Cypher consortium in making this data available and they have worked proactively with them. So, so fantastic news all around. If you're interested to see how a synthetic population is created, so again, the Cypher um, consortium are fantastic and they make available the entire replication package as well um, that is made available via Risher and it's linked within the, within the collection. Now, in terms of the project, it's all about eval evaluating this cost-benefit dynamics when it comes to synthetic data from a data owner, but also from a trusted research environment as well. Because of course, when we talk about trusted research environments, they're fantastic. They provide access to such rich and granular data, but we all know there's actually quite a lot of different steps a researcher needs to take to be able to access data from a TRV. Um, and here I'm talking about consented and unconsented data, so different information governance models as well. It can be complicated easily. Um, we are taking a mixed method approach, and I'm going to be discussing a little bit about the survey that we've done with the data owners, but also about the, the future work packages as well. So um, we are currently midway um, through the project, and we do have some preliminary findings, which I'm going to be discussing shortly about. Again, bear in mind that we do make this difference between synthetic data created from real data and the data-free synthetic data. Because even in terms of cost, there are differences there. So this is something that we really want to, to, to highlight. In terms of the project objectives, they can be easily highlighted as three main objectives. We have efficiency gains when we are deploying synthetic data. What are some data sharing strategies? Okay, I have the synthetic data, I have the documentation for the synthetic data, but how do I share that synthetic data? Should I share it directly via the TRV, but then expecting people to apply for the synthetic data? If it is low fidelity, and Jules will be talking about that, so please do not worry about, about the, the, the terminology being used. Should that be more open? How open and so on? And also evaluate the cost spectrum. How much does it actually cost us to create the synthetic data and the documentation that comes along it? When it comes to work packages, the first work package was a literature review because we were really keen to understand what is out there, what other people have done. Um, we have learned that we actually have some data producers that have already created synthetic data in associated documentation about different sharing strategies as well, but also some gaps have been identified, which at the end of our project, we can actually highlight. The survey with data owners was all about finding out from them, what do they see as the benefits and challenges of synthetic data? Would they be the ones creating it? Would they expect third parties to create it? And we're also doing some case studies with a, with a limited number of synthetic data producers, trying to find out why did they create the synthetic data in the first place? Did they actually encounter any challenges and how did they overcome those challenges? Uh, but also trying to learn from them, why did they pick specific data sharing methods for that data as well? So trying to learn from what is already there. And we're also doing a focus group with TRV representatives. Um, and I'm going to be insisting about this in the chat as well, because this is due to come on the 11th of December. Um, so if you work in a TRV, we would love to hear from you about what do you think are the benefits and challenges as a person that has experience of working with project applications, with output checks, with all of that. What do you think are the challenges? Now, there is also two parallel projects besides our one, one focused on the public engagement. Um, so what does the public think about synthetic data? But also a separate project focusing on researchers as well. 
So even if you are a data user, um, we are not conducting that uh, specific project. Please do get in touch if you would like us to put you in touch with the uh, with our colleagues that are focusing on that. We do want to hear from everyone, um, and, and all opinions are most valuable, and we're very grateful for, for your time. Um, in terms of the literature review, when it comes to this ethical dimension, um, it is clear that there is no established legal or ethical framework to regulate the use of synthetic data. So that's quite a quite a big and considerate highlight. Um, there are quite a lot of ethical considerations that are actually emerging from current literature, including do we need informed consent for creating synthetic data? How do we assess the data quality and the data bias, if any? How do we assure transparency, accountability, confidentiality, privacy, and disclosure? Is there even disclosure in synthetic data? When we go to the legal dimension, very, very similarly, there is no clear legislation surrounding the use of synthetic data. There are some key considerations as per the current literature review that generation and processing of synthetic data should be treated separately. And if we think about it, are we generating? So I'm going back to the data, free synthetic data and the synthetic um, data created from data. Are we creating the original synthetic data from real data? Is that real data, personal data under UK GDPR? So here we can see applicability of legislation to the generation, but not to the to the to the further processing one that synthetic data has been created. When it comes to usages, a lot of the current synthetic data that's all already out there has been used for machine learning and AI training, um, enhancing data sets for better model performance, creating balanced data sets to reduce the bias, protecting the privacy of participants, so we're replacing the sensitive data with synthetic data, for testing and development, and it has actually been quite quite used within healthcare, financial services, and education as well. So how about the, the current gaps? Well, we don't have standardized methods for generating synthetic data. And again, sadly, this can result in a lack of common evaluation metrics, um, especially when we're talking about domain specific, but even cross-disciplinary synthetic data as well. This lack of established legal and ethical frameworks, um, and we all know when it comes to information governance, well, that can be quite a challenge. And of course, the lack of established clear benchmarks or standardized methods for validating synthetic data to ensure its quality and its reliability. And there are other projects coming along that will address all of these different things. So fantastic news on that front. When it comes to the survey with the data owners, so our main objective in conducting that survey was trying to better understand directly from the data owner, from the data producer's perspective, what are the current synthetic data product, production and sharing practices? Um, do they produce synthetic data? Do they aim in the future, near future, to produce synthetic data? What are some challenges, be it technical, be it operational or financial, that they face? Have they found any solutions? Because we do have um, data owners that created synthetic data, and also trying to explore the benefits and future trends and the different support needed within the data producer community. And you might have noticed I'm, I'm, I'm quite focused on the documentation aspect as well, because a lot of the discussions do focus on, on synthetic data, and a lot of people might understand that as I'm just creating the, a data set, just a, a static file. Um, we need to consider that data in the ecosystem when we make it available, we need to have proper documentation that goes with that data as well. Now, in terms of preliminary survey results, um, we do have most of our respondents did come from a data governance and management um, role. Um, so that's that's fantastic. We have people that actually work with the data, people that work in information governance overall. But we do have a lot coming from the research and project management, followed by data science and analytics, and a couple, a couple of others. When it comes to the sector, most of our respondents were central government, but followed very, very shortly by higher education. We've also had answers from uh, VCSE and not-for-profit sector, uh, and a couple from non-departmental public bodies as well. Now, in terms of the data production, the real data that they're producing, 
we can see quite a mix in here. Yes, leading with the research data, 35% of our respondents, this is what they were creating, research data. But the rest do follow up quite, um, quite um, closely. We have governmental data, we have education and financial data, health data, customer data, and the least one was transactional data with just 3% of our data owners producing that. When it comes to the synthetic data production, uh, now we can see in the short term, 39% are not actually planning to produce synthetic data. Um, and we've, we've talked a little bit about challenges with them as well. And we're, we're looking forward to, to delving deeper within the case studies to try to see what challenges have been encountered by the ones that were able to make this data available, to create it, make the data and documentation available, because we think that is going to, to, to lower that 39%. Um, we do have 15% pardon. Of course, it had to happen. It is a Monday morning. Um, we do have 50% of our respondents that are currently producing synthetic data from the real data. 8% are producing the data, free synthetic data. And we have quite a lot that are actually planning to produce from the real data, 23%, and 15% that are planning to produce from both. Because again, there's applicability on both of those. When it comes to the benefits, we have seen data owners saying enhanced privacy, easier compliance with regulation, better provision for analysts working with large complex data sets so they don't have to invest. And this is fantastic from a trusted research environment perspective as well. They don't have to invest and wait for access to understand data sets. They can just use the synthetic data to actually plan their research to see whether the, the data that they wish to use is going to be of use for their research project. Of course, from a person working in a in a trusted research environment, that might come with better data access requests, better projects, um, applications, and of course, fewer failed applications as well, because people will now have access to, to the data to trial it out, to do the code and so on. But also, we're talking about increased data sharing as well, because you you even now, you can have multiple versions of data being made available, uh, at UK Data Service, for example, a, a lot of our collections do have a safeguarded version that's available, for example, for download. And then when you want to go into the nitty gritty, the very rich and granular data that is only made available via our TRV function, um, we call that the UK Data Service Secure Lab. Now, when it comes to challenges, we can see Three of them scored very, very much the same. Um, so we're talking here about demonstrated success in similar organizations. And this is why we're most grateful for the data owners that are, are willing to do the case studies with us, because we think this is going to show that demonstrated success. Um, we also have the need for better funding or more funding to be able to create the synthetic data collections but also the training and expertise development in how do we create synthetic data. And once again, this is what we are so grateful for having, for having Jules with us. But very, very closely, we do have specific, specific project requirements following. So despite the fact that our project is mainly focused on, on, on low fidelity synthetic data, people are actually thinking of creating these higher fidelity synthetic data sets that are made specific with a project in mind. I want to assess X and Y and Z, and this is why I need the certain relationship between the variables to be maintained. Do not worry, Jules will explain all of that in further detail. Um, and of course, availability of better tools and technologies, because who could we be creating the synthetic data in the documentation as well, much faster and much better using at least the machine um, assisted processes, if not fully automated processes. Now, with that in mind, I'm inviting you all to let us know what do you think are the benefits of synthetic data? So you could you can go to menti.com and use the code 88321126. Or if my copy paste is working, there is also the, the code in the chat, um, the, the folding. So if you access that link, we would like to hear from you. What are in your views from a trusted research environment? 
the benefits of having synthetic data available. We're not yet thinking about how is that going to be made available. No. In an ideal world, we have synthetic data made available for any data assets that are hosted in a trusted research environment. And it's not a problem if you if you are not working in a TRB. Um, as I said, we know we have data data users as well on the on the um, on the event. That that's perfectly fine. What do you think are the are the benefits of using synthetic data from um, created from data assets hosted in a TRB. We're getting responsive. That's fantastic. Such an engaging audience. We are most grateful to all of you. Easier access. Easier access. It keeps coming up. Fantastic training. Expanding data sets. Researcher training. Data variables. Familiarization. Um, I do struggle with some words in English. Uh, freely sharing to third parties, exactly. Data discovery, yes. Broader access, privacy. Availability for researchers to assess feasibility. Training. I have changed the slide. We did a testing um, new functionality. Quickly assessing if the data available is appropriate for use. Testing out of this is fantastic. Um, and it's, it's great to see that we have, again, such an engaging audience. Um, and that you're also keen on synthetic data because the applicability is fantastic. And we are moving away from almost being scared a little bit of synthetic data, which is fantastic news. Now, another quick question for you. What do you think are the challenges then? We have seen fantastic benefits as well, but we know it's always a balance. Um, we might have some challenges as well. From your point of view, what do you think are the primary challenges in creating and having the synthetic data collections for all the data assets that are hosted in TRVs? So again, we're talking about all the TRVs, health data, any type of data, research data. Look at all the responses coming. I do love this. That's fantastic. Bias, yes, effort and time to generate. Um, we're going back to that need for better tools and uh, machine assisted um, tools that will, that will help us better. Staff training, yes. Disclosure risk, yes. Creating data that accurately reflects the data set. Accurate representation, resources, resources comes up very, very oftenly. Data is too high fidelity. Um, updates, updates to the synthetic data collection, yes, especially if we're talk talking about um, longitudinal data, for example. Um, how close it is to the real data. So again, Jules will be talking about different um, different usages for different fidelity of data. So we don't need to be so focused on, oh, I really need to make this high fidelity. Actually, actually, there is purpose for all of them. Time to create. This is fantastic because we're getting back exactly what we have been getting with the with the data owners as well. They're the same benefits that are being appreciated, but also the same challenges. So hopefully the, uh, this project and also the public engagement and the researcher project are going to help us address all of this. And I should have mentioned at the beginning, we are we are most grateful um, for the SRC for providing this funding via ADR UK because it's it's definitely a, a piece of work that that needs to to happen. Now, as I said, uh, we do have a focus group just coming along on the 11th of December, and I'm going to put the information in the chat as well. Hopefully, my my pasting um, skills are with me today. Uh, the focus group with the TRV representatives, we're looking for people working in a TRV that would like to talk with us about what are the operational dimensions when it comes to synthetic data within a TRV. So we have seen from data owners a potential um, openness for the synthetic data maybe being created, for example, by data infrastructure, by TRVs. Um, what would be the practical implications? Um, or what would be the practical implications if the data owners are actually creating that data? How would that be hosted? What are the challenges in that? But what are the opportunities as well? Would you need to develop a different, for example, type of access so researchers can access the synthetic data and so on? Um, we are all very friendly um, and it's going to be a very, very open discussion. Um, so if you do have time on the 11th of December, it's fully online. Um, it's going to be on Zoom. Um, 
please, please do join us. It does have pre-registration because we really want to get a, a, a representative sample across the different TRVs in the UK. We're, we're very lucky in the UK. We have a lot of trusted research environments that make data available. So we want to make sure that there's a, there's a, there's a spread of, of TRVs being represented. And it might be the case that we have to, 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 to sort out a separate session as well, uh, a second focus group, uh, if there, if there is a lot of interest. Or also, if you don't have time on the 11th of December and you really want to chat with us, and again, this stands for everybody who might be working in a TRV, maybe we have some data owners on the call as well, or for data users, please do get in touch if you would like to, to, to chat with us about synthetic data, because we want to, we want to hear from you. So without that, uh, with that, um, thank you all ever so much for, for listening to me. Please do get in touch once again, um, and I shall now pass to my to my colleague Jules um, for the synthetic data introduction. Thank you, Jules. So yes, hi, I'm Dr. Jules Kazmaier, and I will be talking to you about synthetic data. Uh, hopefully, you picked that up from everything else that has happened so far. Mintimeter. Uh, which you are familiar with, I hope, from the beginning of this. So I've got a separate um, Mentimeter that I will be recording my uh, Mentimeter actions in. Um, so first, if you can, there's a QR uh, code on the screen. There's also, um, you can go directly to menti.com and use the code that's printed at the top of the screen. And then uh, let me see if I can just paste this in the chat. I will also give you a link to join. So hopefully one of those will work and we can move on to Menti Interaction. So it's just more of a test, making sure everyone's able to get into Menti. It looks positive results so far. Great. <laughs> uh, give people a little bit of time to log into Menti because it does sometimes mean switching between applications on your phone or your computer or dealing with two devices if you've got multiple screens going. Uh, one person genuinely confused. I don't blame you. It's Monday morning. All right. So you will continue to be able to log into Mentimeter as I go uh, onward. But just to clarify a few issues. If you're having trouble with audio, there's basic things like making sure your headset is plugged in. Uh, we are recording this webinar and we'll post it on YouTube. So don't worry about scrambling to take notes or, or capture screens or anything. You'll get it all uh, in another format that you can peruse at your leisure. So just a quick table of contents. Talk about what synthetic data is and is not and what fidelity is and is not, and how it relates to synthetic data, some uses for synthetic data, and some very basic overview concepts of how synthetic data can be generated. It's not an exhaustive list. Then we'll take a break, and then I'll come back for a hands-on, uh, you say hands-on, I will have my hands on the keyboard and you can see what I'm doing with it because it's a code demo. So, Jumping straight in at the deep end, synthetic data. What is it? Well, importantly, it is data that is generated rather than observed. Usually when we say this, we mean generated by a computer, but it's not strictly necessary. For example, a string of numbers made up on the spot is still generated and that would count as synthetic data. So if I just came up with five uh, one digit numbers in a row, that would still be synthetic data. Likewise, you could generate a synthetic commute by starting at a point identified by throwing it a dart, a dart at a map and then following the map, taking left turns whenever you pass a red car and blue turns when you pass a green one until you end at the nearest business after a chicken shop. That would be a synthetic generated commute. Okay, so even with computers doing most of the generating, um, there are many ways to generate from random numbers to simulated sort of environments and machine learning models. There's a lot of options, but importantly, those contrast with observed data. So observed data, unsurprisingly, things like responses to surveys, temperature sensors, essays written by students, ticket sales, 
people making hash marks every time they see a target action happen, you know, if they're doing some kind of observation on the street. If created from real world data, the synthetic data should include checks to ensure that it does not contain any lines that match the real data. So let's move on to some examples that you may be familiar with. Lorem ipsum text. So many of you will have seen or used lorem ipsum placeholder text. It's useful for looking very much like English text, but it is generated rather than real because no one ever sat down and wrote these. Um, synthetic data too. Uh, you can create fake celebrities um, using, I believe this one was generated by generative AI, uh, trained on photos of real celebrities. So it has created some synthetic ones. Great. A random number generator from a popular online search engine. Of course, many of you have used this if you have to do some kind of low cost raffle or prize award or something like that. And you can get more sophisticated versions uh, that allow you to roll a synthetic handful of dice and you can determine how many dice are in that handful and how many sides each of those dice has. And these are, of course, useful if you have an online role playing game group with your friends and you don't want to have everyone rolling their own dice. It's fine. You can just have a synthetic handful. So. What is important to take away from that is that synthetic data is not the same as real observationally sourced data that has been anonymized, depersonalized, noisified, or otherwise treated to avoid identification or disclosure. This sort of data is important, but it shouldn't be accurately described in other terms like anonymized or depersonalized or something like that. Some people use synthetic data when they mean anonymized or depersonalized. Those people are wrong and they're making it more difficult for everyone else. So here's a chance for you to test yourself. Is data from a cycle lane sensor synthetic or not? There's also an option if you don't want to answer. <laughs> Yeah, I think everyone here uh, is, is hopefully either has uh, a good base knowledge of synthetic data or has listened to the earlier part of the presentation in which I said that sensors are observations and they're not synthetic. How about predictions from a weather forecast? Are they synthetic? Ooh, you are not prepared for this so far. Ooh, ooh we got some disagreement. All right, interesting, interesting. Ooh. Oh, synthetics making a comeback. And at least one person has, oh, three people, out there. they're just not sure, which is fair. So generally, because with weather forecasts are predicting the future, they cannot be made from observations. We cannot observe the future. So they are synthetic in the sense that they are not observations. They are generated by some kind of algorithm or method or forecasting software, but they are not generated by observations. So well done to the nearly half of people that admitted they don't know or think it's synthetic. It's tricky because they can be based on data. The model that predicts the forecast can be based on data from uh, sensors. You're right, but the prediction is synthetic. How about census microdata? Synthetic or not synthetic? Also an option to rephrase the question. The small sample of data, microdata by the way, is the small samples of data that include actual responses but that are treated to prevent the identification of the household or individual. So many of you have quite rightly said these are not synthetic. They are managed or noisified or depersonalized or carefully selected in ways that make them safe to share, but they are not synthetic. How about the output from chat GPT? <laughs> yeah, I, I think we're all on board with this. This is synthetic. The speech or text or, um, you know, the output essentially from AI large language models is synthetic because it is synthesized responses. Complicated stuff. Uh, and is stuff you just made up in your head synthetic? So if I fabricate 
a, an anecdote about a coworker who stole my lunch, um, that would be synthetic. Unless a coworker did steal my lunch, at which point that's that's just an anecdote. But uh, yes, good. I think everyone's broadly on board. I uh, appreciate this. Moving on to fidelity, another big topic and very important. Fidelity means faithfulness, but it's very important to know that data faithfulness is not binary. It's not a matter of is it faithful or is it not? Instead, you have how faithful is it? So not all synthetic data is created from real world data. Uh, Christina mentioned earlier that I, I have coined a useful term, data free synthetic data. And that's um, data that is made from maybe metadata or from random number generators, something like that. It does not have to come from real data, in which case there's nothing for it to be faithful to. Fidelity is an irrelevant concept in that case. But if it is coming from real world data, you need to have an understanding of how close it is to that real world data and I mentioned earlier that when you're generating synthetic data from real data, you have to compare real data and the generated synthetic data to make sure no lines match. Fidelity is essentially what counts as a match. It's a bit of a philosophical concept, how long is a piece of string and all of that. So synthetic data can be faithful on some, but not all of these uh, features. So, you know, does it have the same number and type of variables. You know, does it have three numerical variables or two categorical and five numerical? Are there dates? Are they in the same format? All of this stuff. Then you can have sort of descriptive statistics that can match between the synthetic and the real. Are the mean and the range and the standard deviation and the distributions, do these match? How about the documentation? How similar is the documentation? Does it give all the same information? How about the volume of data? If your real data has a thousand rows and your synthetic data has 20,000 rows, that's a difference in volume that makes it less faithful, but that might be useful still. How about relationships between variables? Uh, are they still related? Are they related to the same degree? Are they related in the same direct direction? There's a lot of things. There's a lot of other features as well. This is just a sampling to get you thinking. Let's look at an example. Here I have one that is labeled real and one that is labeled synthetic. They have the same number and type of columns. So in that case, it is, my synthetic is very, uh, the, you know, very faithful to the original. However, we look at the contents of Q, for example, the original has zero and one and the synthetic has three and four. They have the same distribution, they have the same total number of categories, but they are different categories. So that is semi-faithful on that feature. And then X, Y, and Z, we can see, you know, the real data has whole numbers and the synthetic data has decimal places. So that's a difference in precision. And that might matter or it might not, but that's another way that your data can be faithful or not. You know, we can look at, are the, the means for these columns the same? Yes, we can see why, for example, the means are the same, but the distribution of, and the range is very different. Just something to think about. We'll come on to more of these topics later. Now, the relationship between variables, this one's a tricky one because many of the ways that we use data and therefore many of the ways that we might want to use synthetic data is about the relationships between variables in that data. In this example, we can see that height and weight have a strong, although not a simple relationship. We could create synthetic height and weight data that recreates this relationship fairly well. But what if we wanted to add in more interacting variables like age, ethnicity, occupation, location, um, status for health conditions, you know, diabetic or not diabetic, something like that. And if we add any other potentially other interesting but complicating factors, that makes the relationship very hard to preserve in a faithful way. Um, because there will always be a couple of people that really stand out on their own in, in this relationship, those outliers. If we want to preserve the relationship to the fullest extent possible, it makes our outliers 
more closely matched to real people. So very closely, for example, if you have the range and the relationship, then someone is going to be recreated in the synthetic data, and that would be a problem. So if we want to accurately preserve the maximum of height and weight, while also preserving the relationship between height and weight and the distribution of the real data, you end up creating a fake person that is a very close match to a real person. And that's one forbidden by what synthetic data should, should have no exact matches. But in theory, it's also a, a sort of indication risk. It's not a disclosure risk because this person does not exist, but it indicates where a real person might be. And for height and weight, that's not very important, but height and weight and maybe medical status and location and occupation, that starts to become really identifiable in the real world if we have a synthetic data person that matches all of those things about a real world person. So that's the question you have to ask yourself. Is the relationship important to preserve? Is the range important to preserve? You can't keep it all. You have to decide what you need to keep and what can be let go. So again, synthetic data has no disclosure risk because there is no real data to be disclosed. But near matches of high fidelity data do have an indication risk. And that is an unacceptable risk when you're de dealing with very personal or very problematic data. Something to bear in mind if you're working with high fidelity things that are based on real things. So high fidelity synthetic data, what it means is that we can never have be 100% faithful or it would just be identical to the real world data. If you want high fidelity synthetic data, you have to kind of custom build it to suit the particular data set, research question, use case, and generation method. You need to carefully clarify which features of the original need to be faithful, which can be unfaithful, and of the ones that need to be faithful, how faithful? In what way are they faithful? Because you're going to have to sacrifice something. Fortunately, greater fidelity is not always better. Some synthetic data is in fact more useful if it is not faithful, at least in some specific ways. So, for example, um, Christina mentioned that a popular use of synthetic data is in AI model generate training and also in healthcare. So let's think about a common example that we might use. An AI tool to categorize a skin lesion, uh, an image of a skin lesion by risk to say, right, this, this mole is fine, don't worry about it, or this mole looks a bit dodgy, get a professional looking at that. So the problem is real data for this has relatively few photos of skin lesions on people of color, you know, on darker skin tones or at least on diverse skin tones. And the problem with that is, is that we could create a synthetic data set that was very faithful, but it wouldn't be any better uh, at helping us evaluate or train a model on diverse skin tones. So what in that case, we would want to create a synthetic data set that is deliberately not faithful to the original on the proportion of skin tones or on the range of skin tones or on the um, maybe proportion of skin lesions that were problematic on skin tones, all the different combinations there. So you, anyway, you want to be unfaithful sometimes. And that brings us to the purposes, because some purposes require synthetic data that is faithful as faithful as is reasonably possible, and some work better when it's not faithful. Now, first of the several ways that I, I the, the different use cases I will address is preview. And that is a purpose you're probably aware of. It may, you probably used it yourself, but you may not have thought about it as synthetic data. It, you might think it was just a sample preview or a, a demonstration, an example. Typically these are small, maybe just one row, maybe five or 10 rows, but they should be faithful to the number and types of fields, the format that is in those fields, any features that make the data unique, and they may indicate features or relationships of interest, but they don't need to do so in a, a realistic or high fidelity way. So this is 
the kind of preview you might give if someone is looking to apply for data, but that data is secure or controlled or, or otherwise um, needs some kind of permission or application process. People probably want to see a preview. What, what actually does this look like? What, what are the fields? Are they numbers? Are they categories? Are they, you know, whatever. That's useful. You've probably seen it before. You didn't even know it was synthetic data. Now, another is toy data sets. Uh, these are also called proof of concept data sets. Um, and you, if you go looking for code tutorials or something, you're almost always using synthetic toy data sets. These need to be sufficiently large to demonstrate what it is, whatever it is that they're demonstrating. The concepts theoretically could work on the real data. So whatever it is you're using this toy data set, this proof of concept data set to demonstrate, in theory, you should be able to do the same thing with the real data. Um, they're useful for visualizations and maps and outputs and things like that. They're often considered a preliminary step. Um, so, for example, if you want to apply for funding to do a big synthetic data project, you might create a simple synthetic data set first and show that in principle your analysis or your API tool or your modeling concept would work. And then you say, now give us money and we'll spend um, a year creating the real synthetic data set that we will show the concept on in real life. Now, have you ever used synthetic data for a preview? or a proof of concept function. Uh, so far, one person is, no, two people confidently never used either. Okay, that's fine. I'm not going to um, give you any demerits or anything. One person has used a couple. Oh, ah, here we go. Now the numbers are coming in. Yes, so some people have used both. Some people have used proof of concept. Some people have used preview. Some people have used neither. One is not entirely sure, and that's fair because people probably don't always tell you if the, the sample data you're looking at came from a synthetic or real set. You know, uh, yeah, lots of us maybe don't know how often we accidentally interact with synthetic data. Okay, we've got some more examples of how synthetic data is used. Availability. So uh, you are probably aware that lots of data is not as available as, as we might want from a researcher side. Um, potentially it could be available, but it's expensive to get, or it may just be impossible to get. So this kind of synthetic data should be sufficiently large for its purpose. Um, and that purpose is to address the fact that currently no data is available. Could be because the, the data that you want is about rare or extremely negative events and we're usually busy dealing with those events rather than collecting data. Uh, could be about unethical situations, could have unfeasible requirements. Um, this may be a preliminary step as part of a larger research pro process, or it could be the whole process. So let's talk a little bit about um, the kind of data that might never be available. So when we talked about the skin lesions, uh, example. In theory, we could go and take very good pictures of lesions on a variety of skin tones and we could address the problem in the, the data. We could do that. So that is data that is not currently available. But for example, if we want data that is about um, nuclear disasters, we're not going to just go set off a bunch of nuclear disasters so that we can have good data about them. That is not appropriate. Another one is if you need data about um, maybe children raised without any language input. It is unethical to just raise a bunch of babies until they're five or six years old without ever speaking to them and then shove them in a room together to see how they start to learn to communicate with each other. Unethical. Don't do it but you can get computers to do it. You can raise computer simulated babies to an age and then force them to interact. That is not unethical. So forewarned is forearmed. Um, so those are some occasions where availability is the issue. Another one is presentation. This is a little bit like the preview data, but rather than um, useful for someone who maybe just want to, might want to get the data, you want to present it at a conference, or you want to use it to teach a class, or you want to um, 
you know, do some kind of collaborative working in which you want to give people access to something, but you don't necessarily want to go through the process of getting them all access to the real data. Again, it should be sufficiently large to make your point. It should be representative or faithful in the ways that matter for what you're teaching or demonstrating or uh, sharing about. You should be careful that it cannot be mistaken as real, so you ought to clearly label it as synthetic data, possibly appending the word synthetic in front of each variable name or something like that. And you should thoroughly test it to make sure that it is not uh, any kind of um, indication risk or something like that, because if you're doing this publicly, you want to make sure it's suitable for the public. So, who here has used synthetic data for availability or presentation purposes? Oh, we got uh, one neither, one both. Uh, presentation is popular. Good. Uh, yes, very good. Excellent. Yeah, good, good, good. I did see one um, use for synthetic data for availability purposes was that EKGs are actually quite time consuming and difficult to get. You know, EKG results sort of the brain activity. It's not tr trivial to, to get a lot of EKGs, certainly for people with certain conditions. So because there's a limited amount of that, they had to train AIs to create more synthetic EKGs. That was a, another availability purpose. Doesn't seem to matter. Nobody here has used it just for availability. Okay, on to code development. This one's very popular. Lots of you will have been um, aware that you can write code and use it to work with data. Again, this should be sufficiently large. And often code development works best when the data is deliberately unfaithful. So that is, um, it might be much larger than your you expect your real data to be. It might contain errors that you hope or don't exist in the real data, but might exist in the real data. So missing variables, wrongly categorized things, things like that. Um, and it's useful to have that kind of unfaithful data so that you can make sure that your code does not um, stop a loop and just quit and flip over the table and get angry and refuse to do anything. You want your code to give useful error messages in case there are real errors in the data or to deal with them correctly. So if you find a one, a zero one instead of a one, you just automatically convert it to a one or something like that. So this is another way in which synthetic data is very useful for code development. And related to that, remote work. So lots of us collaborate uh, or we work at home or, you know, something like that. We don't all have access to um, big machines, so we might need to push our code and data to a big machine and let it crunch the numbers in a big way over a weekend or something like that. This is not something that we can all do on our computers automatically. So in this case, synthetic data is useful. It, it needs to be large and medium or high probably, because in this case, we're going to be doing the analysis more or less on the data. But we need to make sure that the data that it's used, the synthetic data we use to do the analysis is faithful in only the ways that it needs to be. And it's as large as it needs to be that we can uh, share it between institutions, that we can push it to a, a high-powered computer, that we can do some kind of cloud networking thing. It's unlikely that we can get permission to use the real data in all of these cloud and push to high-powered computers and multi-institution access. So yeah, in this case, you probably do want as faithful as you can get away with, but uh, within a limited context. So have you ever used synthetic data for code dev or remote work reasons? Yes, code dev, great. Yes, both. Ah, oh, fantastic. We've got some great participation here. Lots of people still never used for either, and that's also fine. It's important to know, You certainly, I certainly don't expect everyone to know about all of these tools if you have never heard about synthetic data before, 
hopefully learning about some of the options and how it might work and how you don't necessarily need fancy, high powered, like very serious developed stuff um, allows you to maybe open up to synthetic data or at least be aware of it. If someone in a future collaboration of yours suggests using synthetic data, you'll, you'll be like, ah, ha, ha, yes, I know what that's about. Let's get on it. So good, good answers here. Thanks everyone. Now, very, very briefly, I'm going to talk about a few different ways that we can generate synthetic data. The first is handmade. So you can just, out of the amazingness of your brain, write down a few rows. You can make them obviously synthetic or not. So you might use Fakey Mick Fakerson as a name and the moon as their address or something like that. They can be representative of the real data or not. Um, and they can be, yeah, it, you can just make them up. This is quite useful for the preview purposes because, because it's fast and easy. Um, but it's potentially also important for code dev because maybe you need a set of data which you are confident has exactly one error and you know what kind of error it is. So you might, you know, it's potentially useful there. Another option is random or nonsense. So you can create all the columns and designate them the right categories and then just have a computer fill them with appropriate nonsense. So you can random numbers here. Um, random combinations of letters there. You can do combined things. So random combination of letters followed by the at symbol followed by gmail.com or something like that. So you can do more random or more nonsense or mostly random, mostly nonsense. Both of those are options. These are obviously more useful at volume. It doesn't make sense to get out a, a random number generator to write one number. You can just make up a number. Machine learning. So this is probably what most of us think about when we think about the synthetic data is either created to train machine learning models or created by machine learning models to do something else, potentially to train machine learning models. It all gets a bit looped. Never mind. So there's lots of different machine learning methods. Uh, there's supervised methods, classification methods, unsupervised methods, you choose the method based on the data that you have and the problem you want to solve. So um, I won't go too into this because we do cover this in the code demo a little bit. Um, important, important to point out here, linear regression counts as machine learning. Ooh, you've all just got a new badge you can put on your LinkedIn profile that you have used machine learning. Simulation. So I talked a little bit about this when I talked about simulating little children that weren't exposed to language and then forced to interact. Some people would also include artificial environments like wind tunnels or wave pools or vacuum tanks as simulation. Uh, I won't go into that because in, unless we're talking about engineering, you know, most of us, if we're working with healthcare data or justice data or something like that, we can leave wind tunnels aside. But computer simulations in which you create a synthetic population or a synthetic set of organizations or actors or, or government agents or something like that, and you give them rules about behavior and then you let them behave and you observe their behavior. Now, because that's an observation of a synthetic person, it's still synthetic. Synthetic data conclusions. So we're coming up to the break here. It is generated, not anonymized. Please tattoo that on yourself, or at least remember it. Uh, fidelity matters, it matters very much, but high fidelity is not always feasible and higher fidelity is not always better. There are many purposes for synthetic data. There are many ways to generate synthetic data and synthetic data is a real key feature for reproducibility if you're working with um, controlled or, or secure or sensitive data. You're much better off creating a synthetic data set that can be shared free, freely and show people, 
here's my code that I used on the real data. And here's a synthetic data set that you can apply my code to, to show how the code works, how you get these outputs. There are further reading and or listening if you want. Uh, these slides will be made available to you, so don't um, struggle to jot down URLs or something. I have some contact information. Again, these slides will be made available. Also, you can just search my name. There's very few Kazmaiers out there. Um, and we have a couple of final questions. So what impediments or knowledge gaps do you think still prevent you from using synthetic data? Um, these can be quite abstract. They can be quite specific. It can be, you know, your supervisor doesn't like synthetic data. And so you're never given permission to use synthetic data. Yeah, GDPR, knowledge. Knowledge is a, is a big one. So yeah, knowledge gaps. So just how does it work? Hopefully the code demo will help. <laughs> lack of resources. Yeah, lack of time as well. Lots of people. Yeah, time needed to generate. Lack of time. Agreements with data controllers and producers. Yeah, lots of um, data owners are still a bit like scared of synthetic data. Um, hopefully they will attend one of my sessions and become less scared. But uh Hard to say. Okay, got some good options here. Data protection, awareness, knowledge. Yeah, okay. Finally, what comments or questions do you have? And this will be moving into the break. Um, so I will let everyone put in their comments and questions. I will not answer them until after the break. Um, so let's say, uh, Christina, what time do, do we have scheduled for the break to be ended? That would be 11.15. Just, I need to tell you how long a break you get. It's at least 10 minutes, I think, but depends on whether we want more time for um, code demo. Okay, so, well, positive comments. Thank you for your positive comments. I do appreciate that. <laughs> Um, let's think, um, let's come back. It's 11.04 now. Let's come back at 11.15 and, uh, we'll head into the code demo. What would be the fidelity depending on the use cases? Yeah, I think we'll, we'll explore how to make different kinds of fidelity in the, um, code demo. And so I, I will talk about, you'll be able to see the different kinds of fidelity. And we can talk a little bit about like why it's useful or not useful to have these different kinds of fidelity. Have I investigated R tools as well as Python? I have, I needed to pick one for this code demo, but we are looking at putting out some asynchronous learning materials, um, hopefully by sometime next year. And we hope to do those in R as well as Python. Utility, quality assessment, consensus on scale of fidelity is one considered low and high. All very good questions. I think some of them will be addressed in the code demo. Uh, possibly not all of them, but we can take your questions and comments, put it into future uh, versions of this. All right, we're less than a minute away from coming back. Hooray! Although uh, maybe maybe I'm being facetious here. Yes, lots of people seemed quite keen on the uh, code demo. So that's what we'll be doing next. Um, let me just replace. Oh, no, that's fine. I will share my screen. And um, you'll be shocked, I suppose. Probably not to learn that I will be sharing this. Oh, we have a GitHub repository, oops, um, with quite a lot of options if you want, but the synthetic data option is um, a selection of resources used for synthetic data webinar series. So if you open that, uh, if you've never used GitHub before, there is the option to download a zip file containing all of the things that I have. You could open it with GitHub Desktop if you have that involved. 
You could copy the URL for this desktop and use it to clone a repository. Also, you require GitHub, uh, a Git installed on your computer for that. Um, but don't worry about it too much. Um, you can also just work with things here in the browser. You can go into the subfolders and things like that. However, I have it open in Jupyter Notebooks, which allows me to interact with it directly. Um, if you want to interact directly through the browser, I recommend Jupyter Notebooks as an option. Uh, R, you can also get like R options for this. But I will be opening the IPYNB, it stands for, um, I don't know, I Python Notebook essentially. And it does take a little bit of time to open. I should have done this beforehand. Let me just restart and clear the output. This will also take just a moment. But a Jupyter Notebook is like an R Markdown document. It combines some text fields like this, which if we click in is highlighted, that's a cell uh, of text, but there are also code cells. To run these, you can hit, um, I hit, the control enter, and you can see the little asterisk shows that it's running. You can also select the cell and hit run. And then if you're working in different tools and different browsers, you might find other options work for you as well. So while the cell is running, this is my first one and it just like imports things and installs things and makes sure that I have all of the software options needed to run the code I do later in the code notebook. So what I will be doing, if we scroll back up, uh, so this section imports the packages we need, imports the data that we will use and checks that data in two different ways. So this first cell is importing the packages we need. It gives a lot of output, but that's uh, unavoidable. So when it finishes running, I will move on to the next cell. Uh, if you've never used Jupyter Notebooks before, don't worry. Just look at this as if I was coding in any other kind of code interaction platform. Um, and the principles carry over to other code languages as well. And if you just want help converting it, you can actually put uh, code from one language into chat GPT, and it will help you generate code in another language, like you could put in Python and ask for what's the R equivalent of this. Just saying. Uh, so importing data. Again, I click in the cell and hit uh, control enter to run it. And it shows us uh, the contents of the input folder and then also reads in a particular file I have, height, weight, CSV, and it stores that in a variable called HW original. Uh, let's check the data. We can do that simply by calling its name. And this will give us a little preview of the beginning and end. Uh, there are other methods for checking the data. If you want the top 10 rows or any number, if you change that number 10 dot head, will give you the however many you want. But at the start of the file, uh, you can also there's some extra credit work in here. So this is this notebook is set up for people to work through and gain skills in Jupyter Notebooks and in Python for, for working with data. You can skip these extra credits if you want. They tell you how to change the value of head and also what tail does. Hint, it's very like head, but the opposite. So let's go on to exploring the data, which is perhaps more interesting for us. So height, weight, or HW original dot columns gives us the column names. This is not surprising. Another way we could do that is HW original dot info. This gives us the column names again here. We have gender, height, and weight, uh, but it also gives us the type. So object, float, and it gives us um, how many rows there are. So zero to 9,999. Um, so that a little bit more information with info. There's also describe. Um, there's group by, all kinds of things. So describe, I mean, it, the, it works, the descriptive statistics. Oh, I, I 
some typos in here. That's fine. I will work on it. But gender works more or less the same. So describe everything split into the two genders. So rather than take the gender column as a feature, it's now using that as the descriptive to describe these other things. So you can get how many female and male um, rows of data there are, the mean for female and male, standard deviation, minimum value, interquartile range, all of this stuff for height, but also weight. Good. Uh, value counts. Let's look at that. Um, there's 5,000 male, 5,000 female. So again, it's, I mean, gender here. Uh, there's an extra credit work, which is to put one of the other variable names and count how many values have that. So either height or weight. Now, moving on, besides descriptives, we also want visualizations. Most of us are probably visual people. I mean, in, in a data sense, we probably like to visualize the data. So a simple scatter plot of height and weight gives us that. And we can see this clear relationship. Um, it's very, there's a lot of central tendencies here. You won't be shocked. But let's do with color, because we do know that there's male and female values here. So we, when we split it by color, we see the same general relationships, but now we see that they're centered around different points. So that makes sense. I mean, there's other things we could do. We could change the size of this display. We could change the colors. We could add titles and access labels. I won't go into that. That's about how the code language you work with functions, and it's perhaps less interesting for us to discuss. Um, there's also other options. So here I use SNS to create scatter plots. They work much the same as matplotlib did, but they have different basic colors and styles. So in this one, you see that the dots have a little outline and the basic colors are blue and orange instead of yellow and purple. It's fine. Let's think about distribution. Let's put our data um, so we're going to plot a histogram of the original data looking at height into 30 bins. And there you go. Nice central tendency for height. This is not surprising if we've worked with height data before and assume most of us have. Uh, there's an extra credit here for changing the number of bins. Um, here we see on weight, there's a bimodal distribution. So this is, um, things have thickened. Yeah, that's not a, a comment on weight. That's just, you know, the plot is thickened. So let's look at the distribution for height split into male and female, because even though we get a, a unimodal distribution for height with 30 bins, it's probably too overlapping. Um, distributions. And in fact, that's what we see. Uh, they're, they're close. They're very close, but there's a lot of overlap, but they are not identical. So let's look at the same overlapping distribution split into male and female for weight. And here we see much less overlap. Much They're, they're much less close. This is why our simple 30 bin overview of height, it looked unimodal, and our simple overview 30 bin weight looked bimodal. It's because when you split them by male and female, the amount of overlap accounts for whether they look or don't look unimodal. Now, we could say, what are the common distributions that our data might be? Well, it might be log normal or normal distribution or power law or uniform or, you know, exponential, chi-squared. You're familiar with this if you've worked in stats for any reasonable amount of time. You might not remember what all of these are right off the top of your head, but, you, you know, these are the common distributions. So let's find out for male height, female height, male weight, female weight, what is the best fit distribution for each of those. 
It's fitting our distributions. It's fitting, it's fitting, it's fitting. And the answer is normal, normal, gamma, and normal. So for most variables, the best fit is a normal distribution. This is probably not surprising to you all. We've worked with height and weight data, I'm sure, before in, in stats classes. Um, but there will be extra credit if you go on to use gamma distribution for uh, female height. It looks like that one's gamma. So now we are actually getting into creating synthetic data. What you want to do, but when you're creating synthetic data, unless you want very trivial stuff, is to get a sense of your real data. So what are the distributions? How many, you know, what is the range? What is the, the mean? All this kind of basic understanding stuff. Because if we want to replicate that stuff, those shapes, we need to have a good understanding of what they are to begin with. So let's start with low fidelity. Lowest possible fidelity creates random numbers of things in all three variables. We have gender, height, weight. Here we go. Right away, looking at this, we can say this is good in some ways and bad in others because what we have is negative and positive numerical decimal values for gender. That is definitely not a good match. Height, also we have negative heights and negative weights. This is dodgy stuff. And if we look at it on the scatter plot, we see quite rightly, it is not at all like our original scatter plot. This is fine. This is fine. We'll run a quick test to make sure that nothing in our synthetic version matches our original. It does not. You will be shocked to learn that the result for are there any matches between original and synthetic? False. Possibly because we don't have male or female in our synthetic data um, gender column, which is one easy way it would <laughs> be uh, not a match. So extra credit, you can, you know, do work on that on your own time. Low-ish fidelity. So we looked at that lowest possible fidelity and thought, yeah, it's it's pretty random, but is it any good? So this time, let's um, a little bit. So this time we have um, no negative values. In fact, we now are drawing from, we've given it a range essentially. We've said we want a hundred random values that all fall between 10 and 100. So this prevents negatives and it prevents um, a bunch of really long trailing decimals. So it is slightly more realistic. And if we plot it, um, still, you know, we still have numerical values for gender. So we could, we could be uh, more realistic, but at least we don't have people with a negative height. We're getting more realistic quite quickly. And does it match? No, it does not. There's still no match between our synthetic and our original. Again, extra credit. So low fidelity. But now I'm designing uh, gender to be male or female. So here we have a clear valuable difference. Uh, we still have height and weight. Oh, uh, also I put the range of the original data. So our low, highest and lowest height and weight in the whole data set is now the highest and lowest for our height and weight. So now this is much more realistic and probably lots of us will be fine with this. You know, the scatter plot does not show the relationship we had between height and weight, but if we're code testing, if we're making sure that people from multiple different institutions can log into a particular code notebook and they can edit it, uh, this synthetic data might be fine um, because it has taken me 14 minutes to get to this point, and some of that was hand wavy explanations. So, if you want a quick and dirty testing option, maybe this is enough. In this case, very low, not the absolute lowest, but very low is still quite good. 
Let's just double check. Do we have any matches? We do not. Um, so now you're thinking, great, we can test and make sure that we can launch files into some kind of cloud shared server and we can all access it, but that doesn't really help us address our research questions. So let's look at medium fidelity. So in this case, um, I'm starting to use some like, you know, some more detailed things. And it turns out that having a male and female is a problem for some kinds of re linear regression models. It wants numerical categories, not named categories. So here I switch male and female. And I've done this by creating a new value, new variable called height weight numerical, and it is equal to height weight original. And then I go through and replace gender equals male with zero and gender equals female with one. So not creating anything synthetic yet. This is just working with the original data, but now it's in numerical form. And so again, I get my mean and my standard deviation, and I store these as variables. So height, mean, height, standard deviation. And then I create an array based on um, the height values. Essentially, I just, I pull out that, that column, save it as a separate variable. And I create a linear regression that fits, that takes the height array, and it creates a weight array based on that, based on the, well, it creates a linear regression model that takes height and weight and finds out their relationship. And store that as a variable called model. And then I use that variable to uh, create, score the height and weight. So it's saying our height and weight, this is essentially the numerical linear regression model for our relationship. We're going to use that to create new value. So this time, we create data that has gender. There's 50 zeros and 50 ones. Height is a random normal distribution using around the mean that we found earlier and using the standard deviation that we found earlier. And weight is empty. So then I start filling that weight by, um, well, so no, this just prints the weight, sorry. Now we fill it in this step. And that is, so we use, we fill weight based on the prediction that our model creates. So this is, runs in a loop and essentially goes down the new random height that we found. And it says, using this linear regression model and this height that it's given us, what do we predict the weight will be? And so now we have gender in zeros and ones, we've got heights and we've got weights and none of them are negative, which is, you know, positive. <laughs> and when we scatter plot that we see, oh, right, it's a little bit too basic. So again, this is fine for some kinds of work you might do. If you want to test, can you create an interactive web portal that um, allows people to look up, you know, the av where they sit in relation to some population? Maybe this is enough to test the code that you do for that. Maybe it's not. Let's just check. Do we have any matches? We do not. So you think, okay, this is good. It's getting more realistic, but I want it to be even more realistic. Um, so this time we're going to do the same basic steps as we just did, but we're going to add some noise to make it less obviously linear. So more or less the same stuff. So we create a, a new output, a new synthetic data set. This one's called medium fidelity two. Height is again, random normal between the, or using the mean and standard deviation. Weight is empty but there is also a noise value. We create a fourth column called noise. And we'll fill that column in. And then again, we loop over it so that it takes the um, height that we created and the noise and it creates a weight. So there we go. And let's just scatter plot this to see how we do. 
Ooh, that's much better. That is reasonably realistic looking, certainly for this trivial data set that has taken me about 20 minutes to create. Again, with hand wavy and a lot of full steps and explanation, which if you were doing this in, on your own, you could skip all that stuff. Let's just double check. Have we created any matches to our original? We have not. Okay. This time, let's do it a little bit more sophisticated. So this time we have, we're going to split it into male and female. We will create separate linear models for each of those, and then we'll jam them back together and see separate if separating them out, creating separate models, adding noise, and then jamming them together, if that gives us what we're looking for. And that is the technical term, jamming them back together. Uh, I don't want to go through all of these steps necessarily, because that will bamboozle or confuse or annoy you. But essentially, this is creating, splitting them and creating those separate linear regression models. This one's creating... Um, the male data, I think. Yeah, and now here's the female data. And then we jam them together. And here we go. So we can see it is better in some ways, not better in the other. So there's a real floor effect that comes from um, some steps I had in there to make sure that it doesn't drop below the minimum. So we end up with a bunch of people clustered right around the lowest values. Maybe we can do that another way. Maybe this is fine. We'll think about it. Let's just check our male and female separate ones to make sure they don't match. They don't, it turns out. And then there's extra credit work as well if you wanna try and go with a gamma distribution instead of a normal distribution. And before you finish, a good data set requires metadata. So this should tell people about who used the data, why was it created, how was it created, all these things. What I like to do is just show all of my code and all of my data whenever possible. So whenever I publish research, I create a, a code notebook like this with the data and the code that people can run on their own machines. And if I'm publishing it in a journal, I like to create a DOI for that. So it's a digital object identifier that allows people to cite my GitHub repository. So they can cite my code, they can cite my data, they can cite it all together. They can cite you know, these little comments that I make in between. Um, that is more or less the code demo, so I will stop sharing unless the questions come up about that. Uh, so let's move to the questions, the Q&A, and I'll start going through this. Um, there was one question that came in quite early. Uh, I think as referring tabular data, there's no standard generative technique. On the other hand, GAN, Generative Adversarial Network, did well with unstructured data like images. Uh, maybe I'm not right, that's why I'm here to learn. No, you are right, GAN, the synthetic celebrities that I showed earlier, those were created with a GAN. Um, tabular data, I don't know, I'd have to see some examples to, to know exactly what you're talking about here. But yes, there are different methods for creating different kinds of data. Clearly this random number generation and linear regression with noise that I've showed you in this code demo wouldn't work for image data. Um, okay, so the next question is, if you have some data that has been created from numerical techniques, finite element analysis, but uses deterministic algorithms rather than predictions, would that be synthetic data? If you then corroborated those simulation results with real world measurements, does the data gathered, gathered from the simulations then become non-synthetic? That's an interesting one. If it's created from real data and a model that takes the real data and crunches it in some way to produce some output, even if that's deterministic, I would say that's probably synthetic because there are features that matter. How, what's your degree of precision? 
what's the model that you use to create? Uh, what data range are you doing? Are they all equally weighted? There's still a lot of decisions there that you would need to specify and share in your documentation if you were to create synthetic data. If you then compared the, the simulated, you know, the output of those deterministic algorithms to real world, I would be surprised if they matched exactly, partly because there are different degrees of precision. So your model might go down to 10 digits after the decimal point, but real world sensors that you're comparing it to go to 20 digits or five digits or something like that. So there will not ever be, as far as I'm aware, perfect matchup. So you, the, degree, the data generated by your method is still synthetic even if it turns out to be very closely related to real world. That just means your models and your process were quite good. Hope that helps. Do come at me with more questions if that didn't answer it. <laughs> Is there a tool you recommend to check fidelity as well as data quality? I use SynthGage. I do not know about SynthGage. I will look into it. Um, it's probably a valid tool um, because, you know, if it's if it's been used before and people are citing it, again, you should cite this uh, as part of your metadata process or, or include it in your uh, code notebook if you're using a code notebook to explain your synth process. Um, I think, yeah, other people will have different checks and sometimes with custom made synthetic data, you will have probably have to custom make the checker so that it compares exactly on what you want to be synthetic or um, high fidelity and what you want to allow to roam freely. Um, but yeah, if other people have other things they use to check synthetic data, please do share those in the, um, in the chat. Uh, otherwise, SynthGage is probably a good tool. How useful is synthetic data in training AI models? That seems weird to me, except GANs. Uh, well, it depends on your model. Like your AI, AI models, AI is very vague term and it can be used. Some people use it for large language models like ChatGPT. Um, some use it for um, like distorting images. And so there's, there's, you know, all kinds of AI in, in images, um, in gener gen the GANs, the generative adversarial networks. Um, but there's also things like um, classification or random forests, random walks, um, sort of clustering, all of these things are also useful. So if you want to test and see how quickly your new clustering algorithm clusters data, you probably want to create multiple synthetic data sets for it to test on in which you know that those synthetic data sets have four clusters or five clusters or eight clusters, and you can test your clustering algorithm on it um, and potentially use the results of those tests to show, do you need to adjust your clustering algorithm? So that's just one case, but there's all kinds of different reasons people use AI and there's all kinds of different reasons people use synthetic data sets and they can be both. Another, um, Example, the, the skin lesions that I that I mentioned in the presentation. We want to train an AI to be good at detecting skin lesions on all kinds of people. And if our data set is biased, we want to use synthetic versus synthetic data that is less biased to make sure our algorithm doesn't cheerfully skip over or, or casually misconstrue huge swathes of people just because the data set was a bit flawed. So that's that's one way. Um, also, if we want to create some kind of AI that deals with earthquakes or nuclear disasters, we're going to have to train it on synthetic data because we don't want to just wait around until enough earthquakes and s nuclear disasters happen. So there's all kinds of reasons people might use synthetic data to train AI, even if 
AI creates the synthetic data. So it does get quite looped. Um, if the real data is small, will the fidel fidelity be high or totally depends on using the generating technique? It, it depends on the technique. It depends on the technique, uh, what, what method you're using to generate and also the purposes. So if you're using it to augment, if, if this and the small data you have is very, very interesting, but you think it, it's too small to, to build enough on, we need more data that's quite like this, we'll, we'll build data. You would specifically want it to not be very high fidelity. Otherwise you could just use seven different copies of the original data set. So it's up to you how you want the synthetic data to be similar or different than the real data. Uh, are artificial environments the same as digital twins? Not necessarily, they can be. Um, artificial environments in the case I was using was sort of highly controlled real world. So things like wave pools or um, vacuum tanks or, you know, hangers with fans and sensors and lights and things. You hang a model aircraft in there and you see how the airflow goes over the top and is turbulent or not. Other artificial environments could be digital twins. They can be simulations that are not specifically twinning anything in particular. They can be simulations that specifically twin something. They can be hypothetical situations. So we might build a model of a city and then say, what if we uh, banned all cars, how would people move? Would they um, go by buses and trains or trams or bikes or walking or would they just flip over tables and get in fights and not move at all? You know, okay, so that's perhaps a bit sarcastic, but you get what I mean. They allow you to do hypothetical things, so they're not necessarily the same as digital twins, but they could be. In slide 51, you mentioned higher fidelity is not always better. Will this also depend on the case? Yes, some cases benefit from lower fidelity. Code testing is one in which you absolutely want code to deal with problems that may or may not occur in your data. So your synthetic data for code testing should include those errors, those problems, those missing values, those um, NANs, things like that. Likewise, if you're augmenting a small but real data set, you would want the synthetic version to be much more diverse. And so in that case, you would want the high fidelity, the, the synthetic version to have a reasonable but not high fidelity to the original. Yeah, so those are two cases in which you might want um, fidelity to be low. Also preview. Uh, or presentation, it's fine to have synthetic data, which is obviously fake. So obviously fake names like Joe Bloggs or, um, you know, fakey McFakerson and obviously fake addresses like the Marianas Trench or the moon or, you know, the International Space Station or something. Okay. Uh, let's see, next question. I am interested in applications of synthetic data for training researchers, in particular in developing the data wrangling skills that are required for cleaning data within the safe setting. Many of the challenges in health data are understanding longitudinal aspects of data, e.g. hospital attendance over time. My understanding tools like SynthPOP are really good at creating cross-sectional data, but not so much at the longitudinal. I would agree with you, yes. Most synthetic um, data packages or um, web portal sort of creation tools are probably geared around cross-sectional rather than longitudinal. Is there, there's a good article on longitudinal synthetic data generation, a method for generating synthetic longitudinal health data, BMC, medical research methodology, full text. However, this seems to be getting into much more complex analysis. Are there any specific tools that are useful to look at generating longitudinal synthetic data? I would say uh, simulations, specifically agent-based models, are really useful for creating longitudinal synthetic data. And I can show you that if you're interested. Um, let me just call this up on my um, 
browser and I will start sharing my browser again. Um, I, I covered this in the last session as well. People were surprised and delighted with how easy it can be to create simulations. Now, NetLogo, this created by Northwestern University, is free to download. It is a very small program, so it is also um, easy to download. Um, but there is also a web version, which will give you options of playing with some of the sample models. So let's look at um, traffic grids, for example. You hit setup and that create populates a little digital world with intersections and stoplights and little cars. And then you hit go to make them go. And they follow rules about what's the maximum speed limit, what's their preferred sort of distance between them and the car and ahead. What's the acceleration of their car? You know, if they were to really flat out, how fast would it gain speed and slow down? And I will stop that here. You can change things like how big the grid is, how many cars, how many, you know, what's the speed. Um, but you can see these graphs at the bottom show over time how this is doing. So in this case, it doesn't necessarily, it's not that useful, the longitudinal data in this case. But you could say, you know, the average speed over time, over time does change. If you gave them more complicated rules about where they were going, then you might see the average speed of cars changed relative to sort of global world time. So you get rush hour at certain times, you get people speeding at dark after dark where there's much less traffic. You know, you could look at things like hospital emissions. If you modeled people instead of cars and you gave them rules about, you know, someone with these characteristics on average has so many hospital visits per year or per two-year cycle or something like that, you could set up a simulation that would output a new row of data each time one of these people following their own internal logic ends up at hospital. So they would then create a new row in your output data and it would have the ID of that agent, that little simulated person. So it'd say person number 14 has gone to the hospital again. This is the you know, the, the description of that event, you know, something like that. Outside of this, I mean, this is a very visual based sim, um, agent based modeling option. You can get purely numerical, like computational models that you just give it the descriptions and it gives you a big table of outputs. It doesn't actually happen to happen over time with ticks and sort of motion and animations and things like that. It's up to you. Hopefully that answers your question. If not, please do let me know. Um, that is, but yeah, agent-based modeling is the best way that I can think of for getting longitudinal synthetic data. Uh, other people might disagree, but they aren't giving this session. So that's what I'm sticking with. Um, about creating a set that can be used to develop cohort descriptions preview to researchers. Why not using a real data set but shifting the values around by column? If 100,000 rows and one row ends up the same, what problem result? And why is that not synthetic data? Yeah, I mean, it, at this point, it's a just a definitional difference. You, If you want to do a preview or a teaching data set using real data that has been anonymized or depersonalized or otherwise treated to prevent disclosure, you're, you're fine to do that. Go ahead, if, certainly if it's easier. Um, but it's not synthetic if it is based off of observations, even if it's been treated. Um, that's that's basically the only difference. Yeah, is is it based is it a treated version of an observation or is it generated rather than observed? I will stop sharing as well so you can see my, my face much bigger. Um, yeah, whether or not one small change counts as uh, changing the data, I you'd have to be very clear that you're following the 
use uh, and agreements of any data that you used that you treated in this way. A completely synthetic data set would be safe to use. Um, but even then, you should be very careful that if you're creating a synthetic data set based off of a real data set, that you were following the terms of use for the real data set. Um, it's possible that that might not be allowed depending on the data set. Uh, it might be that you are allowed, but only if it meets very certain conditions. It's it, You have to be careful with your end user license or your terms of use. Um, and it seems like this is a follow-up question as um, if it's if it's not synthetic data because it's dealt with uh, real data, but it does the job, does it matter? Well, no, if it does the job, do what you want. But that is that sounds like it would be very case specific as in it depends on the real data set you have, the, the analysis and your purposes of demonstrating or teaching. For that combination of data, purpose, and sort of method, maybe it's fine. You don't need to use synthetic data for everything, um, but synthetic data is an option for people who, for whatever reason, maybe their data is not manageable or, or manipulatable in a way that they can use it for presentation or teaching. So they would be better off skipping the manipulation, going straight with synthetic. Or if your purpose is to develop code, you might not want the whole real data set, the whole 100,000 rows, because maybe you want to test how long it takes your computer to do a thousand rows with three different models, at which point, you know, maybe, maybe you could just subset your real data, maybe you could create synthetic data, it kind of depends on your purposes. Yeah. If you don't need synthetic data to do your job, don't use synthetic data. If you find yourself struggling to do your job because of some feature of your data, consider synthetic data. <laughs> okay, uh, if you modify a variable at the start of creating a synthetic data equal male and female, you want to check that your results at the end don't match the original data. You need to make sure you're checking against the modified versions of the original, not the original itself. Yeah, this is true. I think I did not do that in my code demo, uh, well spotted. But yes, you should, in theory, check. So I should have compared it to the numerical height, weight, numerical rather than height, weight, original. I think I can't remember if I did or not. But yes, you if you change male and female to zero and one, when you go to test your, if your synthetic data matches your original, make sure it accounts for that change. Um, among other things, there are other options are possible. Is changing metadata features type a good idea? Just a random question. I'm not quite sure what this question means. Changing metadata features type. I don't know what it means. Feel free to write in another question uh, to clarify, um, but maybe you've You've kind of answered it. But yeah, if, if it's things like changing male and female to zero and one, it's not a good or a bad idea. You have to be clear in your creation process, in your documentation, in your code, for example, why you've made that change. If it's because the linear regression model I, I want to work with doesn't allow categorical variables as an input, then that's a good reason to make the change. You might reverse the change at a later stage in your creation process. Just put that in your documentation as well. Or you might leave it changed and just make it clear. This is a difference between the original and my synthetic. It was well motivated. It's easy to change back if you feel like you need to. I don't feel like I need to. So yeah, it's just make it clear why you've done what you've done. Is generally my answer to metadata and documentation. Okay. Is it a disclosure risk for synthetic data created with reference to real data that checking no row matches the real data means that users know no row, no real person has those values? If you compare 
row by row, it would mean no single row of your synthetic data matches an entire row of your original data. Now that's possibly unhelpful. What you might want to do is check that no row of your synthetic data outside of the name, location, and you know occupation or whatever the combination of potentially identifiable things, make sure that no descriptives match an, another person exactly. So for example, if you created, if you have real data with uh, Amy Adams as, as one of the people and your synthetic data has Shmamey Shmadams as one of your synthetic people, that wouldn't be a match, even if everything else in the row was an exact match. So you might want to exclude name because you, you know that you've deliberately created fake names. So everything outside of name, you would then check, you would compare that. So it really depends what you count as a match you have to be clear about what you count as a match. So for my data, because there were no names and addresses, I compared entire rows. That might not be appropriate for your data. You might only want to compare half the rows. You might also want to set like tolerance levels. So I was comparing exact. So 100 is not a match for 100.000001 but you might want to say anything that's closer than, than that is still a match. So again, like it depends on your data and your research purposes and your method of creation. How close is a match? You really have to be clear about what you mean by a match. Hopefully that uh, helps. But yes, in general, you, it is true that if, if you determine your synthetic data and your real data have no matches for however you determine matches, um, that would indicate potentially that no real person has those values in that combination. You could change that to say, we only uh, checked for matches outliers. So real people who are bang average might be replicated exactly, but you would be really hard pressed to find them. There's, there's very little indication risk there because everyone is very closely clustered around the, the real values. So you might in your documentation say, we only checked outliers or we only checked everything outside of the sort of central 50% or something like that. Again, you just have to be very clear about what you did and why. Um, after you ran the code to determine the existing distribution in your data, how did you ensure the synthetic data stayed faithful to your preferred or chosen distribution? Well, that's part of the code. Um, well, we can go back and look at the, the code again, although I will give you the um, repository, a link to our repository, if you like, and you can check it yourself. I'll just pop that in the chat. The um, part of the generation method included defining the distribution to create. So you could check the same way as we found the distribution of our original data, you could run that step again on your synthetic data. But because the synthetic data is created using that distribution, um, it, it shouldn't be a problem. But again, you can check because maybe in making sure that the height is distributed normally, it did not do a good job of making sure that the weight is distributed normally. So it's still worth checking again. Certainly, if you're cre creating synthetic data that is that you want to be medium fidelity in at least some ways, there's no, there's nothing lost more than a little bit of time in double checking. Okay, um, so 
And the next we have a problem. Create a high fidelity synthetic population based on individual level administrative data inside a TRE. Solution is A, create the data in the TRE, do the checks or then extract it from the TRE to use outside or B, extract the code that was used to create to generate the synthetic data in the TRE so that it can create synthetic data outside the TRE. Let me think about that. Well, it depends on what your research purposes are. Are your research purposes to create a synthetic data set, at which point you probably want to export the synthetic data set. If your research method is to create algorithms or some kind of model, some kind of process that generates a synthetic data based on an input, then you probably want to do all of the testing in the TRE and then the code is yours to use anywhere. You, you don't need to extract the code because that's yours. I could be wrong. Uh, I don't necessarily work in TREs very often, so um, I'm not sure exactly what they do and how they work about like exporting data and outputs and code and steps you followed inside. Presumably there's a, a, call, a call log of things that you've done in your data session. And if you can export that, then that would be equivalent to exporting the code. You could recreate the code separately. And I'm just gonna put this forward start creating synthetic data sets of data outside of the TRE. So get the code that you think will work in the TRE, but develop that code iteratively using data sets that are not uh, protected or, or controlled or secure. And that way, when you go to the TRE, you can be really effective with your time. You can create the synthetic data set effectively and quickly, and you'll have more time to check it and make sure that the distributions are correct and things like that. Um, and you won't have to write code in the TRE lab because I assume that's time restricted in some ways, possibly also computer power restricted, I'm not sure. Um, so yeah, get as much work done outside of the TRE as possible so that you can be very efficient inside the TRE. And then whatever you want to get out of it, that's what you should get out of it. If you want a data set out of it, get the data set. If you want the code or the method or the, you know, the algorithm, get that. Hope that helps. Generate so, uh, synthetic data using, e.g., the linear regression model, and then use the generated data for model training. You're biasing the results because the data will show a linear dependency that may not be there. Yes, this is absolutely a feature of synthetic data that you need to decide when you go set about creating a research data, or when you set about creating synthetic data. You need to be aware of what you're using it for, how it's created, oh. and um, what it's based on, if there's anything that it's based on. And there may be mismatches there. There may be issues with real data that where you know there is bias and you're trying to correct that bias at which point probably linear regression is not the right tool but there are other tools for creating synthetic data so if if that's something you're concerned about with the original data with the output data with the method don't use that method um if you want the linear dependency to show up in your output because you know it does exist in the real world. If there's a logical reason why two features of your real data set, which do have a dependency, should also have that same dependency in your synthetic data set, then you can put that in there. And you can say it's biasing the results, but I think the world has also biased the results, you know? The taller people do tend to weigh more. There is a dis there is a relationship there because they have more height that will weigh. You know, it's something to consider. So it's 
yes, you do need to be very, very clear about why you're doing everything you're doing. And you need to be prepared for people to have problems with the decisions you've made. But that is why being very clear about what you've done and why helps you answer those questions. Um, so if you're trying to recreate a dependency in the real in the real data, it's fine that your synthetic data has that dependency too. All right, if I come up with random data in my head, it's synthetic. If a survey question asks me to do it, is it still synthetic? Oh, you're just you're just being quite ex existential now. Um, it depends on the question you ask and whether you think that answer, if you tell people, pick a number between one and 10, they will pick a number between one and 10. And the observation in that case is what number do people pick? That's not synthetic because you ask people to pick a number, they picked a number, you're looking at their observations of that number. If you're asking a hundred people to uh, throw a bean bag at a big grid that has numbers put out, that will, you know, that's an observation of where people can throw, uh, but it's also potentially a, a synthetic data generating mechanism. You would probably want some more layers of algorithm in there. So for example, if you asked people to pick a number between one and 10, and you use that number as a random seed for a random number generator, that would be much more random than using their original. So do you see what I mean? So it's, yeah. Again, making random stuff up in your head for synthetic data kind of only counts if the point is to make synthetic data. And it only it only makes sense for certain kinds of synthetic data, like potentially code verification, code dev synthetic data, demonstration, potentially teaching. Maybe you might have, make up one or two rows to make sure that some rows illustrate a certain problem very well. Um, but yeah, it's a bit of an existential question. It's a bit like those two doors where the guard at one door always lies and the guard at the other door always tells the truth. Like there's there's a logic to it, but it's not for me. Uh, if your identity is not involved, it may be considered as synthetic. Looks like so there's an answer to someone else's question there. Um, I'd have to go back through the questions to see. If you couple large language models with RAG, I don't know what RAG is, random generation, I'm guessing, random algorithmic generation, is it synthetic? Oh, if both of those are synthetic, putting them together, it still creates a synthetic data set. I think probably yes. But until I know for sure what RAG stands for, uh, it will be a tentative yes. <laughs> Uh, in metadata related questions, I was trying to ask changing a column like integer to float or object to numeric. Yeah, you, you can change whatever you want. You're creating the synthetic data set. You just need to be clear about what changes you're made, you made and why. So change whatever you want. <laughs> you can always change it back or you can always just leave it changed and be like, this, this is life, dude. <laughs> Use it or don't use it. Um, could synthetic data be used as extra feature in machine learning tasks like feature engineering? Or how could synthetic data be used for feature engineering? I'll be honest with you, I don't do feature engineering. Um, if I were to look it up and find a definition for it, I might have a more useful answer. But I would think the broader question, can synthetic data be used to within machine learning tasks? Yes. It seems like you would want specific data sets that have specific features, and then maybe you feed them to the machine learning or algorithm in a certain order. That would probably be a way to do synthetic data as feature engineering. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't see why not. A synthetic data, it's basically just data that has a particular, it, it's just generated data 
that does something you need it to do. So if you generate it so that it has the right things, then it will have those things and you can use it for those things. I'm aware that that sounds quite wishy-washy. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, turns out RAG is retrieval augmented generation. Doesn't necessarily help me. I'd have to look up what this means. I suppose I could retrieval augmented generation. If it includes the word generation, that suggests it is a synthetic data technique. Uh, it's a technique that combines large language models and traditional information retrieval systems. So I would say re retrieval augmented generation is already a combination of large language models and gener information retrieval. So depends on what the output is. If the output is based in real information, then that's just a different way of getting observations. If the output is synthesized, if it is generated, then it is synthetic data. So you might use, you know, large language model to get you the top 10 most popular books on Audible last year. That would be observations. Even if you asked, you know, a smart assistant through you know, some kind of large language model interface, the output would be observations. If you asked it to create a fictitious popular book that makes sense with the top 10 most downloaded books on Audible, that would be synthetic. Do you see the difference? Maybe. Someone has asked if they want to talk about this more and that's fine. You can find my contact details. Um, Jay Kazmaier Complex on Twitter, although I don't use Twitter so much, I'm trying to get out of that, or j.kazmaier at manchester.ac.uk. Uh, there you go. Yeah, RAG is not synthetic, apparently, according to other people. Um, what would be the ideal way of doing quality assessments of synthetic data generated using metadata? I don't know. Quality, it, it depends on what you mean by quality. Like you could you could just run the basic descriptives that most people would say, you know, to the real data. If, if you don't have access to the real data, you can't do that kind of fidelity thing. All you can say is it matches the descriptions in the metadata, either completely or as much as is possible based on what's in the metadata, you know, things like that. But yeah, you would just have to, at the moment it's all a bit bespoke because we we don't have a whole lot of assessment tools. We don't have a lot of frameworks. We don't have a lot of best practice checklists for synthetic data. We're working on it. Um, Christina, I don't know if you wanna share the um, sort of guide that we created for synthetic data documentation. Um, yeah, so there's, um, there's, there's some scope there for, for work to be done on consolidating best practice and, and giving you concrete answers on like, how do you assess this quality or how do you compare these two data sets? We don't have all those answers yet, which is positive in the sense that whatever you do could become the, the right answer if you do it big enough and people care about it enough. Uh, the downside is there's not a whole lot of people to help you do it. And if someone says you've done it wrong, there's there's not a whole lot of like things you can cite to say, I, I did not do it wrong. So you've been out on your own, but you know, boldly going where no one has gone before and all that. Um, there is some questions uh, because the retrieval augmented generation and large language models and things like that, it looks like we're coming up on the, the concept of augmented data. So you can have a real data set that is very small or, or very problematic in some way, and you can use synthetic data. You can create synthetic data that are not small or not problematic in that way and either combine them or, or just use the synthetic. If you combine them, it's called augmented data. 
and it is not the same as synthetic, even though it part of it is synthetic. So it would have different documentation about how that's created because you'd have to talk about combining and you would have different reasons for making your synthetic data different than your original in some way. Um, so hopefully that answers most of those questions. Um, replies are, a lot of TREs wouldn't let you output a data set of microdata, even if it was synthetic, as they would need to validate it themselves that is non-disclosive. Yeah, this is one of the issues that um, comes up, is that people are very afraid of synthetic data because they're worried about disclosure. In theory, synthetic data doesn't have a disclosure problem. It does have an identification problem. And most TREs probably are not prepared to deal with that distinction yet. They may in the future, um, but yeah, yeah. It's, it's one of those things that I expect will change. There's also a question of, do you even need the real data? if the TRE has a service about checking your code against the real data and giving you the outputs that they look, they find are non-disclosive. Well, they may also in the future offer a service that you check your synthetic data generation code with them. They create a synthetic data according to your specifications and check to make sure that there's no exact matches or too close matches. So that's maybe a service that TREs could do in the future or could allow or at least, you know, give advice on how someone might do it themselves. At the moment, there isn't a whole lot of that. Um, so please uh, shout about why you need it, I guess. Uh, the numbers float positive and negative that try CTGAN by adjusting the parameters, tuning the hyperparameters, using multi-levels, layers, higher number of epochs. Yeah, this looks like it was an answer to the question earlier about like changing um, the values, uh, the, the sort of categories, the, the shape of data. Yeah, all of this will matter. Um, it will change your outputs. It will change, you know, how close something is or isn't to the original data. And you have to be aware of that and have good reasons for why you did what you did. But if you have good reasons, then that reason is good. Uh, okay, no, Christina has shared the draft of our guide to documentation. Thank you for that. Um, and then replying to Alan Harbison's Q&A about longitudinal data for longitudinal data for something like a survey with different waves or created census records. The data first needs to be created in long form, synthesized, and then this created hashed ID. Okay, so um, yeah, Jillian seems shared her email address. If you have, if you want to know more about longitudinal synthetic data, Jillian seems to be uh, clued up. She's got some answers. And um, yeah, another recommendation, practical session using some GAN or AE techniques with real data. Yeah, I, you're right. This is a very introductory, very high level, very wishy-washy. I could do this on my own over my lunch break, have a noodle with this stuff. Yeah, more advanced synthetic data workshops hopefully will be in, in the future. The future. It's all very vague. <laughs> I hope that's okay. Um, yeah. Uh, I think we've used up all of our time. There's maybe a few minutes left. I will hang out until the end of the session, but if you have more questions, if you want me to go away, go ahead and shut the, the browser or shut your <laughs> meeting session. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Thanks everybody. Also, thank you very much for participating in the polls and the questions. Got some really good questions, some very in-depth that make me feel a bit lost because AI and machine learning and synthetic data is such a big field. I don't have all the answers, but someone does, as we've learned that Jillian from Edinburgh has some answers, answers about synthetic um, longitudinal data. Thank you very much. Please do let us know if you have more info. If you want to participate in our focus group, sign up. <laughs> it's a, another chance to uh, ask very difficult existential questions. <laughs> All right.
the numbers are dropping rapidly. So I assume everybody is just, you know, waving goodbye and heading out. Um, again, you can find our code uh, at on the GitHub, UK Data Service Open. I did share the link, but it can be made available again in the emails if people are interested. No, um, the rest of the sort of leaders of this session, if you want to turn on your mics and or cameras, if there's any finishing business, otherwise I will just nope out of here. We do hope you'll get in touch with us. Uh, we're most grateful for all the engagement um, and it, it's been a, a pleasure of a session. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.